Greg Morris here, and welcome to this video in week three, Organic Donor Attraction Methods. This is the video where I'm going to walk us through the five organic donor attraction methods we use to deliver our message to our prospect pool and attract new donors to our nonprofit organization. Organic attraction methods are free or near free ways to introduce our proof of case to people we haven't met yet to ultimately ask them to become a donor to our cause. These methods are intended to get people's attention. They're the entry point, the left side of our process here, uh, the entry point to our donor funnel. And combined with your optimized message and, and pieces of this funnel, you'll get solid prospects clicking through each phase, through your landing page, uh, through your proof of case, uh, and so on. And that second step, uh, once they have clicked through an ad, uh, in our case, we're going to be setting up ads, but you have other organic and free attraction methods, they will be led to our landing page. And this is where they will leave us their email address, their contact information. And this is compared to, you know, a good metaphor is if you met someone for the first time, either at a business meeting or more socially, like at a bar or something like that and uh, you've asked for their business card or for their phone number, this is that step where they give it to you. And when they do, they're led to the next step, which is then presenting your proof of case, after which they're presented then with options to continue the relationship with you, one always being an ask for a donation. Okay? So today we'll cover the first step and the five organic donor attraction methods presented in the last video, introduced to you in the previous video. These five being Facebook posts, direct outreach, free events, list farming, and joint ventures. We'll go over these today. After this week, you'll be able to put your whole funnel together too, okay? So what your organic and, and paid ads together uh, lead people to are your landing page, where they leave you their contact info. We're going to build just one landing page today and then you'll be able to continue on from there. And I recommend not going crazy at the beginning. If you're young or new or have a small staff, uh, but you can and should always have a landing page down the road for any special campaign or event um, or ads where you're uh, being led to. Okay, your ads will lead you to a landing page. Uh, an event registration would lead you to a land landing page, sponsorship, and so on and so forth. But for the sake of clarity and sanity, start with one, okay? And we'll talk about just building that one, then takes your prospect to the next step, which is the proof of case. Uh, here, this week, presented as a video, okay? I've written out here a few other ideas you can have on how to present your case, you know, case study, free webinar, and so on. But in fundraising clarity, we're going to talk about how we do things in the 2020s, okay, in this decade. And that's a value video. It's called a value video, delivering our case to people. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, night, day, regardless, crisis or not, it's out there working for you, okay? Um, then people are brought to step four, uh, which is in the engagement options step. We went over this last week, week three. What we want to do in fundraising clarity is get them on the phone. Uh, we want to get people on the phone with your donor conversion script. Okay, with these people who are all warmed up, they gave you their contact info, they saw your video, they're ready and prepped to have a conversation with you. What we haven't talked about yet is getting people to click through to your calendar to request that meeting. And we'll cover that later this week as part of assembling your donor funnel. The last step, uh, the donor experience, we're holding off on that until week six. So what are we covering in this video? Here again are the five organic donor attraction methods we'll be covering today. I'll go over in some depth how they work and I'll provide instructions and templates on each um, as needed so that you'll be able to dig down in each one after I've uh, completed this video and you can take your time and, and review each one. 
So recall that these are all free or low cost, easy to implement, uh, not a lot of tech here, okay? And you need to be using these while you establish your proof of case, while you're, while you're testing your message and honing your messaging. These methods require some manual labor in an ongoing way, and they don't necessarily scale up well, but that's great because once your message is attracting and converting prospects into donors, you'll be able to move over to the paid methods uh, and then really make those work for you, okay? Again, even while you sleep. So here is our first attraction method, Facebook posts. And posting to Facebook, it's a method, again, it's free. Um, and you can use this method to like to to share bits and pieces of your case over time. Um, you know, a fact here, a, a story here, a piece of a story there, um, an impact here. You know, some facts on why you're necessary here and there, and so on and so forth. A donor story here and there, and with pictures and so on. Um, Use your organization's page if you have one. If you don't have one set up yet, that's fine. Uh, if you have one set up with few followers, that's fine. Use your personal account to share real stories in a way to share how your organization works towards its mission. You can even use it to test these images and verbiage to see what strikes a nerve with your prospect pool and uh, your friends that you already have on Facebook. And that's what you need to be striving for with each post anyway. Posting over time, it's also a way to build your case over time and establish your authority on the subject matter at hand. Regardless, you're posting here to promote your organization and get new donors. Again, it's pretty simple and it's free, okay? Uh, the cons here are it does require time to build up your following and it requires consistency. You can't just set it up and forget it. It needs to be maintained. All right, so let's go through the process to use this method here. One is set up your nonprofit page on Facebook. If you're a nonprofit, you have an EIN, an employer ID number, um, you'll be able to hook that up and even begin accepting donations through Facebook. Uh, to build your following, you'll have to use your personal Facebook profile, all right? So if you have a page on Facebook, again, that's great. Posting every day, okay? If you don't have a page, or if you have very few followers on there, then use your personal Facebook profile or set one up. And if you're thinking, well, my personal profile that I do have, it's just not appropriate, you'll need to clean it up. You'll need to clean it up here to be representative in your organization to be the spokesperson or a spokes spokesperson for your organization and you'll need to clean it up here in step two and three and let's go over how to do that this is my personal uh, Facebook page and you, you can see it's clean uh, banner image is just this and the profile image I have selected here I change it sometimes but right now I just like this picture of me. This isn't my dog. I actually have a Shetland sheep dog, but uh, this is my brother's Basset Hound. Uh, it's just a good picture. I feel it's more personal than, you know, the professional picture that I have where it's just me and I'm wearing a jacket or, or that sort of thing. And um, uh, it's uh, uh, okay. You want to be personal. It's Facebook. You want to be personal, but don't have silly pictures, okay? No doing shots, drinking beer, <laughs> um, silly selfies in the bathroom mirror with the toilet in the background, something, you know, be aware, all right? Um, I do recommend adding a bio here. So um, I typically do have something in there, uh, and uh, I recommend that you relate to your organization, the nonprofit you work for, your mission, maybe your title or something more uh, descriptive about what you do. Something that pulls people in is a, is a little more exciting, you know, not just executive director of this nonprofit organization.com. You will want to see how the public views your Facebook pro profile. Uh, and to do this, you click this little I right here, view as. Now, this is how anyone who is not connected to you as a friend will view your 
public Facebook profile. Okay, so they here you see they don't see my bio right now according to um, this page that I have set up for this video no posts available um, but that's what you want to do so you can take a look at if someone is wanting to learn more about you uh, but they're not connected to you on Facebook you want to have some public posts available okay you want them to be able to say oh this guy is legitimately with this organization and I'm able to see this information and uh, you know they'll make a snap judgment about you and if uh, uh, they're they're making a decision right now whether they should give to your nonprofit or not this might be the moment where they say no or yes okay to create a post in Facebook uh, you do what you, you would usually do and you just want to make sure that your posts are going to your public and not just your connected friends. If you're if you're posting something that you only want to be visible to people you're connected to on Facebook, then obviously click the friends and then post here. Um, and uh, if you are posting for on something related to your nonprofit that you want everyone to see, then you can create a post for the entire public, and then anyone who comes to your Facebook profile through your link. Mine is facebook.com slash ccbiggs, c-c-b-i-g-g-z. Um, that's a nickname I was given by my sister uh, when I was young. <laughs> but uh, that's how you find and view my Facebook uh, posts that I've posted for anybody in the world to see. Now, if for some reason you feel like, well, you know what, Craig, I have a Facebook profile um, and it goes back years and it's not exactly appropriate. <laughs> I just don't feel it's appropriate for me to be using my Facebook profile on Facebook. Okay, well, you know what you can do? You can set up a list of those connections that you have to your nonprofit where you only want them seeing posts related to your nonprofit. All right, so when you do that, you want to set when you want that you set up a list so do that by clicking home and then on the left here uh, you want to see more but you want to go to your friends lists and here you can see different lists that you can post to obviously I post to public and I post to friends and I have some old ones that I set up here like a long time ago that I don't really use however um, I have one that I set up here just my NPO so now, whenever I want to post to just them, you'll see here my post here and right here. You see who it's going for, going to. People who are in my list, my NPO, are the ones who will be able to see that post and no one else. All right. To create a list, if you are wondering how to do that, you go back home here. Again, see list, see friend, friend list, create list here, and then just set it up. You can name it whatever you want, my list, and then you just add the people who you want to add. Um, or as people request you to be their friends, then you can add them to this list. Okay? And that's that. Now below this video, you're going to see uh, resources for this video, and I have a cheat sheet basically uh, that I've written for each of the five organic methods. Here is the one I've set up for you for Facebook posts, and I have the process set up here, and I have some resources, and I have created links that take you directly to some necessary topics for us who want to create Facebook pages for our nonprofit organizations. You can click this, how to create a Facebook page. I have a, a link to frequently asked questions for nonprofit organizations. And then this third one will be necessary for some of you who have been maybe posting uh, as uh, your nonprofit's leader and you are setting up a Facebook page for your nonprofit. Perhaps you now need to convert all of that over. Everyone who you friended on behalf of your nonprofit, uh, you want to convert that over to a Facebook page. Facebook does not like 
personal profiles used for organizations or businesses, okay? You need to make a Facebook page for that. And then you can manage that with your personal profile account, all right? So that's number three in this process, which is unless you don't mind posts visible to everyone, uh, which I recommend that you do post publicly, uh, create an organization list like we just talked about. Number four, post daily, at least weekly, successes, struggles, insights, stories. Again, share your case piece by piece. And when you're using your personal Facebook profile page, share something personal maybe 20% of the time. It's okay. You're a person. You're a human being. It is Facebook. You want to let them know that you're not a robot. You want to let them know that you're a human being, right? Number five, then, as you meet people, add them as a friend on Facebook, okay? And you will want to then invite them to your nonprofit's Facebook page when you do so. This will get them uh, warmed up before they have a call with you. If you have a call scheduled or a meeting or something like that scheduled with somebody, um, add them as a friend on Facebook or at least invite them to like your uh, organization's Facebook page. And of course, you know, use LinkedIn as well. That's very useful in nonprofits when we're working with people, especially in a more, you know, professional sense, or we're connecting our nonprofit with potential sponsors and other businesses, uh, granting programs and that sort of thing. All right. Okay. Organic attraction method number two, which is direct outreach. So just like it sounds, Direct outreach is simply contacting someone directly who you believe to be a good prospect for your cause. Outreach can be done by email, it can be done by phone directly, uh, Facebook or LinkedIn, you can send a letter in the mail. Okay, so this is direct outreach. It's fast, it can be fast, it's free, it's not technical at all. This is old school nonprofit fundraising. It does require time and it also requires that you already really have a strong message. If you're taking time to uh, make a call, reach out to somebody with an email or a letter even, um, it's going to be fruitless if you send a bunch of messages out that are weak. Okay, and this is the process. Number one, meet new people online or at events where affluential people gather. Affluential means influential and they also have capacity. Um, that means they have the ability to give and particularly give big uh, for your organization. And uh, this actually can be or. They can have influence or affluence, but this word um, Affluential is a word that means uh, both, and of course this will give you uh, more bang for your buck this way. This is the proactive approach to meeting people, to getting donors, to attracting new donors to your organization. But you really need to be proactive all the time in your everyday life when you're working for a nonprofit. And uh, using this method, you should really be, frankly, be deploying, employing all of the time when you're out and about and uh, or you're online carrying on conversations. When you meet someone who you think is a good prospect, use direct outreach. This is method number two. Maybe you're just browsing on Facebook or in a local or related Facebook group. Or maybe you're in a conversation, just generally speaking, and you meet someone who you believe is a good fit for your organization. Don't just ignore it and then leave them. You'll regret it. Don't just leave them thinking, well, you know, they're going to find out about my organization eventually anyway, and they'll donate eventually. You know, they'll see maybe some PSA that we have out in the radio or the news or whatever uh, on TV because the odds of, of that happening to you are quite low. Um, you have to make the spark when you have the opportunity and you have to do something that there when there when there is something there you have to ignite it. So approach prospects like this when you come across them and you want to be proactive and introduce yourself and follow up with them which is number two here. If you think this sounds all far too simplistic to work. You must know direct outreach is a very powerful tool and it's helped me and countless others, fundraisers and volunteers both, 
people who have become some of the best donors and some of my best case studies. And if I were to look at the cumulative effect of my direct outreach over the years, I'd imagine countless dollars and hours have been given just by simply making simple efforts like this. So don't underestimate the power of direct outreach. So number two in the process is getting their contact information to follow up with them. You want to connect with them on Facebook or LinkedIn or at the very least send a message to them a text or email within 24 hours. And even if something happens where you just don't quite get their contact info, which happens, you never know, uh, use Facebook or LinkedIn and, or even Google and just do a search and see if you can find them out there to follow up with them within 24 hours. Trust me, it's worth it. Uh, when I think of the connections I've made over two decades, both for my career uh, professionally and the connections I've made for my nonprofit organization at the time, some of these people have become leaders within their own within these organizations and have they've gone on to do great things so don't think of this as you're chasing them down and harassing them or feel guilty about it or you know like you're you're chasing dollars here or something you're building community and a mutually beneficial relationship here for everyone involved okay that's great fundraising step three here is a really useful tool here too and i wish it had been around a long time ago because I may not have lost some contacts I'd made. It's called Yesware. The link is, I'm sure there's similar resources out there. This one's Yesware. The link is in the resource page here and you can s use it to see if someone gets your email and opens it. This is helpful as we're tracking our performance and seeing if our method works because too often you'll send a message and just because of the mere volume of email people get these days and they may not open your email before it gets pushed down in their inbox so you'll know if they don't open your email so just try again and don't feel guilty about it things happen or connect with them on LinkedIn or Facebook and send them a message that way as well uh, and you know try to approach them at different angles it's okay don't feel guilty or shy about it because you're simply following up a conversation that you had already started. And if the relationship comes to a dead end, at least you checked it out to see if there's something there, okay? Never feel guilty about relationship building for your nonprofit cause, for your organization. That's part of number four there too, of course. So when using Facebook or LinkedIn, add them as a contact before messaging, you know? or else they'll likely never get your message. That's just sort of how that works. And number five in the process, if you need any help, use the template sam uh, sample that I've provided as guidance, okay? I'm trying to make this as easy as possible here for you. So you'll see the link here and you can just click on these. Yes, where email tracking software will take you directly there. And then I have uh, a template here that you can just click on. Use my template if you need some inspiration, some help getting started. All right? Okay. All right. Uh, number three, organic attraction method. Uh, free events are free to the prospect and, of course, should be free or near free to the nonprofit organization as well. Uh, an open house can be an example of a free event. It depends on the organization, of course. Um, the very best possible free event in this scenario is for a board member to hold a free event at their own home and invite their network, okay? Their friends, family, any colleagues or acquaintances who might have a remote interest in your cause. Here, you'd invite others as well. Um, uh, this is an opportunity, leverage this, for you to bring people that you, when a, when a board member has an event like this, lever leverage the event for yourself as well. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to bring people that you are about to call or you have already just called to share information with them. You know, you can warm them up or warm them up some more. Um, you know, people who should have any reticence or hesitance to engaging as a donor, great opportunity to pull them further in. Here, they'll, they'll not only be able to learn more 
information. They'll be able to meet others who are already committed to your organization deeply as board members. Uh, they'll also be able to get a sense of your authenticity and the community that you've built, okay, that the organization has. So, you know, it starts with your board of directors as the nucleus here, and everything just sort of spreads outward. Here you're giving people a free sample of what it's like to actually be a donor and supporter of your organization. All right? A board member hosted event is the absolute best option here and I cannot <laughs> stress that enough. Second best to this is any other volunteer or a current donor that's willing to, to hold a and host a, an event like this at their home or, or somewhere similar at no cost or low cost to the organization. What's great is when you do have a volunteer or a donor who's willing up their home and they have a beautiful home <laughs> that's made for entertaining. Those people exist out there. Maybe you're one of them, maybe not. They're out there. So, you know, they might have a, a, a home that's just built for entertainment. And they enjoy doing that, and they'll just jump on the opportunity. In Chicago, I worked with a donor whose family actually owned a really popular furniture store. and saw it on the TV all the time. And uh, his home was in Lincoln Park. So... Um, it was um, like a penthouse home, and it was very vertical and lots of glass, and it was just beautiful, and it was such an attraction for people to come to, and uh, and then see how you know this this family, this this guy, whose name was built in furniture sales in Chicago, how they, he furnished his home. And uh, it's an opportunity for for you and people in your organization to brag a little and say, hey, this family supports our cause, and so should you. You know, It was beautiful, and it felt exclusive to any person who you needed to give that extra feeling to, uh, to let them know you appreciate them. You know, Even if you're appreciating them as a future donor, you're showing them what it's like to be a donor to your organization and to invite them up for this exclusive event. So... Then, of course, there's the third step of this process to present your organization. So you find a good spot in the venue, wherever you are. You gather people together after, after they've come together to get their bearings, relax a little, and chat, and meet some people, and talk about your organization. And here you present your organization. And events like this are great to make announcements as well, should you have an upcoming campaign or something like that, or a new program. Uh, or celebrate successes. Whenever you're able to ask for donations based on success, you're able to invite people into a winning organization. Great thing to remember here. You're able to show them that, hey, we know what we're doing. And if you donate today, you're joining a lot of other really amazing donors and you'll be part of an exclusive community, successful, and making a real difference. It's almost like you're inviting them to be part of a secret club. <laughs> and if they give a big gift, like the rest of the people in the room, then they'll be able to be uh, able to go to uh, other cool house parties like this in the future and then meet other shakers and movers in town. You'll have networkers in your donor group as well, and that's fine. You know, practical steps in this process for you and your fundraising staff are in number four. Meet people. Get their contact info which likely you'd already have uh, at an event like this where you know who's coming. But if not, meet them, get to know them a little, follow up with them, and teach any of your fundraising committee volunteers or your staff to do this as well. You'll have to encourage them and, and, and give them permission to do so sometimes. And this is important when you want your organization to grow. So I've again included a cheat sheet to provide other ideas and inspiration. But again, the house parties are always a hit especially when your volunteer enjoys throwing parties like this. And if they want to do this, but they don't necessarily think they're good at it, but are willing, then you are someone who is good at it, at throwing you know, events like this, uh, for free or low cost, should offer to turn their home into like a tasteful house party with them, okay? Um, as long as you have someone who knows what they're doing, you're good to go, okay? All right. So uh, with this uh, cheat sheet here, I have some uh, examples, some ideas for, for some other events like that. So organic attraction method number four, list for farming. Um, okay, 
So we use list farming when we have existing lists or already have a database full of prospects. And these could be lists of people who had previously given their contact info to our organization for some reason and had clearly indicated some interest at some point in time. We don't want to miss any opportunities here. So we invite this group to join us for something like a live webinar, which is what I think is one of the best ways to reach out to this group. It's easy, it's efficient, and you can engage or re-engage, uh, if that's the case, these people here by delivering your, your case here to them. A simple list farming webinar can be a great windfall, and I've done this in the past to reconnect people who may have gotten lot lost by previous efforts. It's a great way to bring in new or renewed donors with little effort. Okay, so the pros here are their low cost, uh, minimal time, and quick ROI. Okay, just let's go through the process so you do it right. Obvious cons here are that you need lists and existing relationship that you're reigniting. Okay, so if you're part of a nonprofit that's been around a while, you'll probably already have all sorts of lists all over the place. We talked a little about this in week two when we talked about centralizing your CRM data and feeding your CRM from all corners of your organization. Most people really do underestimate what's already right under their nose with all these contacts and it's worth this minimal effort that you could potentially generate a group a great group of donors and bring in a load of donations quickly for you. So if you don't have a list of of, of people um, or a database because you know young new or whatever uh, or young organization that's fine use this method later on but for people who have some lists they don't know what to do with it's worth the time to just shake the tree we call it beating the bushes and you know you can rekindle some relationships you already have and didn't know you had or kindle some 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 donor relationships out of some other types of relationships should they be like a business relationship or something the process here is to number one first segment your list or database to prepare for an email broadcast with uh, whatever tool you're using you want to deep dupe your existing CRM to ensure you're not gonna accidentally treat your existing donors as someone you've never met <laughs> big mistake to avoid here okay so be careful then step two is to create slides for your PowerPoint to webinar presentation okay now I've set you up here with everything to create simple webinars here so you just look down here I've provided what you need um, because I've personally created and presented these exactly uh, and use them and produced results with them and here you have a sample my sample PowerPoint you can use as a template however you want to adapt your own uh, as well as my sample script here that you can adapt and you'll see how I've been able to create clear presentations using uh, my slides and script together and there are other resources out there of course but I also have have two resources here this is um, links to go to webinar which makes it really easy to set up a webinar uh, you know you can create invitations and a link to your webinar and host it as well as a link here to Camtasia which is my video recording and editing software I use to create these very videos you're watching right now so there you go everything for you to build your first video based off your proof of case all in one cheat sheet right here so this is short circuiting everything for you again here because it wouldn't be enough to just say okay go out make a video make a webinar just do it because unless you've done this before I know you look me you'd end up spending hours or days trying to research and sort through all the resources out there and potentially spending a bunch of money on software you don't need or uh, you know reading reviews and that sort of sort of thing so these resources are just enough of, of what you need I believe and you're not going to overcomplicate what you need to do to just get the right video and right web webinar up and running okay uh, it just gets you ready to start connecting in a real way with your donors and start bringing in donations so sooner rather than later just simple okay that's for you now 
this is all in the samples too, but steps three and four uh, and five are integral. Because once you've hosted your webinar, you're gonna wanna present your engagement options to them. And in order to do that, you're gonna need to have these set up on your website. So of course, you're gonna have the the uh, option to uh, uh, for people to make a donation right then and there, of course. And we're going to get you set up with your self-service calendaring this week. But any other engagement options you have, volunteering or membership or buying a ticket to something, you want to have those ready and linked as well. Links to those opportunities, how people respond. Uh, or maybe it's just a phone number, okay? Whatever, however you want people to respond to these opportunities, you need to have those ready to go. Um, so once you have all your ducks in a row and everything set up with the webinar, you invite your prospects on your list at least four days in advance prior to the webinar date then you'll want to send them one email each day leading up to the webinar date and then even for those who do not attend the webinar you'll have recorded the webinar available to them along with the slides so this will ensure that you leave no stone unturned and no money on the table with these lists you've had sitting around collecting dust and not working for you now you have uh, them working for you Okay, list farming. Again, it's one of the easiest and quickest wins when you do it right. Especially when you, say, perhaps walk into a new job, maybe, or a new organization, and you've, you're, you're, you're given access to a bunch of these lists, or they're thrown at you, and you're like, okay, now what do I do? So, especially if it's a big list, um, you use this method, and in a short period of time, you're bringing in donations and impressing everyone around you. So, enjoy this trick, use it wisely, it's not a trick, it's a real thing, but go through the steps and definitely only after you have a strong case, okay, but deploy the list farming donor attraction method. Got it? Okay. So, next, organic attraction method number five, um, joint venture. And I do need to actually about... Um, these methods. I want to uh, issue a warning about these methods here too, particularly the last one, but this feeds into this one as well. And I don't know how big your lists are or, or whatever, but generally if you have lists with a few hundred upwards to several thousand, you'll be okay handling your 3% who end up answering your call to action, right? That will include, you know, contacting you, or calendaring with you, or calling someone, or you, or wanting to volunteer with whatever other engagement options you offer, okay? However, if you happen to have a huge list, like 50,000 or more, you know, something huge like that, you will want to segment your list and reach out in a more piecemeal and strategic way. And I say this because when your message is strong and you elicit a response that does get the 3% you're looking at, 3% out of 50,000, <laughs> you won't be able to handle that many people wanting to schedule a call with you or wanting to engage with you in a real way, okay? And you just can't handle it because of that sheer volume. And you don't want to do that. You want to be careful when broadcasting email lists this big and including a call to action that will require your time and could potentially end up turning off people because you're not able to respond to them after you've called them to action. Got it? So, joint ventures, or JV for short. Um, these are when you partner with another nonprofit organization or a business, a for profit. Or even with, say, an influential person who shares your organization's values and aligns with your mission. So, for example, in my example, a domestic abuse intervention organization could have a joint venture with an anti-bullying nonprofit, and we could together produce a webinar uh, to their constituents. Or we would, we, my organization would produce a webinar to their constituents. So in this scenario, we serve similar customers and, and, and we can help each other. We have similar missions. Or maybe, you know, another example would be a nonprofit summer camp partnering with a business that sells sports equipment. Okay? You can go on with the examples here. The challenge, again, 
with this method is similar to the previous method in that it requires you to be somewhat, at least, established already. You'll need a solid reputation or at least some time to establish and prove your reputation in your case and, and establish some trust with those that you're targeting to partner with. If you have that, then, then great. Uh, but I want you to be aware of something again. Some of us in the nonprofit sector will go out there with the pitch that partnering with us will make them a lot of money somehow. And that should not be your focus. Um, it sounds, maybe, hopefully, it sounds silly to you, but I just see it happen too often. And when you're pitching sponsorships, it's okay. And I encourage you to try to quantify the ROI for the business you're pitching to. But something like this, this JV attraction, donor attraction method, keep it mission focused, okay? Uh, remember this. So that is to say that you're pitching to your JV as a way to raise awareness of each of your missions, regardless of whether or not it's a, a nonprofit or a for profit. It's about your reputation and theirs and how solid your mission and case are, because no one wants to risk their reputation by partnering with someone they don't know well enough just for some quick money. No one wants to do that. So a good organization <laughs> just doesn't want to do that. Good business doesn't want to do that. So remember that reputation and delivering value is more important than making a quick buck for your partner, okay, when you're pitching to them. When you have conversations with potential partners out there, you want to show them how you're going to be able to serve their mission and strengthen it and bring awareness to it through this joint venture. And you need to do this and establish trust way before you even get into like the financial benefits of it. So all that said, the JV method is powerful. Um, it's a great method if you have an established if you have an established reputation and track record. And the process is written right here um, for you, one through five, and it's in the associated sheet as well, which you can download. First, consider all the possible partners out there for you and list them out. Even in the nonprofit sector, we have competitors. So take a look at who those are and who serve similar customers, primary and secondary customers, you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to week one. Uh, similar to yours, and pick those that are non-competitive to you. So like in my example with the domestic violence intervention organization partnering with an anti-bullying group, those two could and do definitely lift each other up. It's not competitive. The nonprofit in Chicago I worked with in so many capacities over the course of two decades um, now is partnering with neighborhood barbershops. <laughs> they're actually both working with men, and because men talk in barbershops, they're able to engage in conversations about men's issues, including domestic violence. And it's a great partnership. And uh, the barbers will say so. They feel like they're delivering so much more beyond what their businesses even do already. There's a million examples out there. So whatever your cause, think through um, the possibilities or bring your ideas to the Facebook group and uh, we can discuss those with you. So we've covered steps one and two. Step three is something that only helps with trust. Don't ever think the opposite. If you're thinking, well, we trust each other, we don't need a contract or, or we don't need anything in writing, you're wrong. <laughs> These cover both your hind ends and when something arises, you'll be able to deal with it. This is especially true when something uh, deals with money. When, you, when, you, when you're dealing with money in a, in a JV, uh, then something written out in advance is important. If you're doing anything that results in donations or, or any kind of revenue, then know that there will be uh, a way to handle it when you write it out. You know, are you splitting everything 50-50 with another nonprofit? Is this a business that you're working with and they want to recoup their costs that they might have before handing any revenue over to you? Um, will your call to action send people directly to your page? Or are you going to need to figure something else out with your, your partner? 
um, be clear and upfront about your expectations because they often differ from what your partner's expectations are. Okay, no assumptions. And number four, schedule your webinar or similarly, I've been asked to present as part of a, a regular monthly staff meeting before, but whatever the format, make sure your host introduces you. You don't want to look like you're barging in and hijacking a meeting for your benefit. And number five, of course, don't leave without a call to action. And your host will know, this sounds obvious, but your host will, will know about this in advance. It's important for you to tell them in advance. Be clear again about if you're inviting people to call you or go to your landing page or if you're just leaving information behind, whatever. Um, that's the least effective, just to leave information behind and hope people will, <laughs> will uh, pick it up. But be clear about what your expectations are and what your call to action is going to be. Agree to it with your, your, your JV partner and uh, do it. All right? I've left you, again, with a cheat sheet for this method, so be sure to follow up with this video. Uh, go through it and see all the resources we have with you. Then if there's any questions, hop over to the Facebook group and ask and we'll get you going. Promise. So now I've gone over all five organic donor attraction methods. I've left you with more information on each one as well that you can download and open and, and there's even more links through the downloads that I provide you and you can spend some time going through those a little deeper and thinking about how they can be applied to your organization. But before we end this video and move ahead, I want to leave you with some action items. So first, uh, well, start thinking about the five organic donor attraction methods and decide which ones you're going to deploy this week. Which ones are, choose one or two organic methods to implement this week. I don't recommend that you do all five. <laughs> Um, but a mixture of two or three even is good. And focusing on one, it's just fine as well. It's great, actually. The last two that I showed you of the five require that you already have some reputation and have your proof of case established. Okay, so simply pick from the choices available that we have. Select which ones you're going to deploy immediately, okay? Not, not next year. <laughs> All right, this week. Um, before you move on. Second, clean up your Facebook profile or start posting on your organization's Facebook page. As a spokesperson for your organization, you really must clean up your profile and start speaking on behalf of your organization and bringing people in this way. And so should anyone else who's a spokesperson for your organization. It's really something that's these days virtually non-negotiable in fundraising. Facebook's a tool for amplifying your vote, your voice and establishing presence and you've chosen this profession and you're going to have to act like it on and off of Facebook. Um, it's just a tool. People are going to see who you are. They're going to see you interacting in the community. If you appear to be two-faced, you're not going to be effective. So you can learn how to keep personal and and uh, a public profile separate. You know how to do that now. Uh, and if that's what you want to do, that's fine. And uh, But use Facebook. You have to use Facebook in this day and age to begin attracting new donors to your cause and uh, right away. Third here, especially if you have your message established, create a list of between 10 and 100 prospects to begin direct outreach with right away. Start using the direct outreach method and getting in top contact with these people. Send them a personal message or connect with them on Facebook or LinkedIn and start getting direct outreach messages to one to three people each day. This is how small fundraising shops start bringing in lots of revenue just starting from zero or whatever you are right now and then slowly and methodically doing outreach over time that builds up just like compound interest if you do this every single day 
you'll be amazed at what things start happening to your organization and what can, can happen in, in 30 days. You'll look back 30 days from now and say, wow, as long as you're doing this every day. So you're going to get results. If you, you follow these action items, you're, you're good. You're good. Um, okay, so all of this, uh, everything in this program, but this, this, this is chock full of, of options and, and things to do. And uh, this is going to be available later on. I'm not deleting any of this or anything. So if you choose a couple methods now or just want to start uh, with one and come back later, it's fine. I wanted to, des to design this program so that it serves as a resource forever for you, like in an ongoing way. So come back for a refresher or, you know, use the group uh, whenever you need us and we'll be here for whenever you're ready and whenever you might feel like your message is established enough to do something different. Okay, so you're going to get momentum now and you're going to get results and you're going to start having a newfound confidence, true, as uh, things get moving. So take your time. There's no rush to move to the next video, but when you're ready, I'll see you there.